It's a wonderful day here in sunny Southern California, and I thought I would stop by the lake on my way home, as I believe it's healthy to spend some time outdoors each day, and if possible, to get a little vitamin D from the sun. That said, I thought this episode we could explore a Persian occult theme. While the modern Iranian language is called Farsi, an Indo-European language like English, Spanish, or German, Muslims conquered Iran, and that's why their Aryan language is today written in Arabic script, even though the Iranian people themselves are not Arabs. Many other elements of their Islamic faith predates Islam as well, and this is evident in some of the Sufi sects, which can still be found in parts of Iran, which have esoteric practices that are largely frowned upon by the Orthodox Islamic regime currently in power, and in old legends and fables that involve mystical creatures, probably one of the most famous being jinn, which is where we get our word for genie from. Jinn has many interpretations, where some identify the word with spirits or demons, and some jinn are innately good or evil. Islam acknowledged spirits from other religions and adopted this concept even though it predates the faith itself. In an Islamic context, the term jinn is used for supernatural entities, which some Iranians may call shaitans which are devilish spirits that incite humans to sin, not through overt aggression, but in a more subtle way, such as whispering to the heart. They allegedly try to lead humans astray and are therefore depicted as ugly and grotesque creatures. The Arabic word Satan originates from a Semitic root meaning astray. In pre-Islamic Arabia, this term was used to designate an evil spirit and poets and writers that came into contact with Jews and Christians moved the meaning closer to our modern understanding of the devil. The devilish context of shaitans appear in the book of Enoch and since then has come to designate a general perspective that is a manifestation of evil. In the Quran, shaitan rise against heaven in an attempt to steal its secrets such as immortality, which is associated with the forbidden fruit in the story of Adam and Eve. Shaitan are also referred to as teachers of sorcery, who sometimes succeed in liberating some of those guarded secrets. Some Islamic literature, or hadiths, claim that shaitan can move through the blood of humans, with some passages stating that they might appear in dreams and terrorize people. That's why it's customary in some parts of the world to cover the mouth when you yawn, since the shaitan might enter the body. Some Sufi writers connect the descriptions of shaitan mentioned in hadiths to human psychological conditions, which are reminiscent of Carl Jung and his archetypes, based on the notion that shaitan reproduce by laying eggs into the heart of humans. They're linked to inner spiritual development. In this way, shaitans are not an external entity that we understand to be Satan or the devil, but represent an internal struggle we each face between the temptations we have for evil, which often refers to lust and carnal desires, and piety. A good analogy we see in movies and cartoons sometimes is when someone is making a decision with an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other, both trying to influence the person's decision by whispering in their ear. Lie to her. It's okay to lie to women. They're not people like us. Uh, I don't know. Hey, where's the other guy? Come on, you bastard. I'm late for work. Oh, 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 this is perfect. In some folklore, witchcraft is also traced back to Shaitan, and this involves unlawful carnal activity, or sex magic. While both devils and jinn are featured in folklore and are responsible for misfortune, possession, and disease, jinn are sometimes supportive and benevolent. 
They're mentioned frequently in magical works throughout the Islamic world, summoned by a sorcerer, but also as an animal spirit with a subtle energetic body. The etymology of the word jinn is very much in dispute, and while I can cite several examples, I'll stick with the ancient Persian understanding of the word, which stems from Avestic literature and jaini, which is a sort of wicked female spirit, similar to a succubus, which has found its way into the Kabbalah and was certainly even known in Babylonian times and pre-Zoroastrian mythology of the people of Iran, or Aryans. It is in this female context that jinn can be responsible for causing a man to lose his essence and spiritual vitality. Like Judaism and Christianity, Islam also reveres the Garden of Eden story with the tree, the serpent, and the forbidden fruit which I contend are symbolic of the enlightenment and spiritual degradation, both available through the carnal act. The tree is understood in esoteric circles to be a metaphor for sex. This is true in Buddhism, where Gautama achieved his enlightenment under a fig or Bodhi tree. He was not just sitting there alone with his eyes closed taking a nap. This can be seen in ancient Assyrian and Babylonian depictions in the hand gesture directed at a tree of a thumb wedged in between two fingers known as the fig sign, which in ancient Indian culture depicts the lingam and yoni, and among early Christians was known as the manus obscena or obscene hand. In Japan, the sign is called sekusu and means sex. And in Indonesia and the Netherlands, it is known as a gesture symbolic for sexual intercourse. So while some modern religious groups might consider the Garden of Eden story to be about a literal talking snake, as they insist on taking the story literally, in ancient times, they use symbols. In France... The male orgasm is known as the small death. And it's in this context that a jinn can be seen as something that can drain a man of his life force and vitality through temptation. This may also be the reason behind the hijab, which is meant to combat temptation. And while in modern times, many claim it's about modesty or dignity, its esoteric origins have to do with these ancient tales of forbidden carnal temptation and the potential for women to attract jinn. Why do jinn possess people? It's important to note that jinn possession is a reality. There are those who deny it. However, it has been agreed upon by the consensus of the scholars and it's something that can be sensed as well. So jinn possess people for three main reasons. Number one, out of love number one out of love so jinn they fall in love with people and this is extremely important for our sisters especially so for example you're leaving the house and you're not wearing the correct hijab you're not properly covered or you are wearing a lot of makeup and you have beautified yourself and you're leaving the home then don't forget that there are other creations besides men There are men who are going to look at you, but at the same time, a jinn may fall in love with you. And this is something very, very common. I had a case where a jinn had possessed a sister. She was waiting at the bus stop and the jinn fell in love with her. She was walking through a park and the jinn followed her. She was waiting at the bus stop and the jinn fell in love with her and it actually possessed her. And when they fall in love, they're very, very difficult to remove because their love is like almost a blind type of love. It's like I would rather die than leave this individual. So it is understood that jinn or shaitan can possess or enter a person's body according to some Islamic or Sufi scholars. And this possession can lead to being influenced and directed towards temptation or acts that are considered sinful.
with all these salawats and all these actions they have a shield all around and all shaitan wants now is that you make a sin and as soon as the servant sins they come in to attack. But this is a very dangerous time in which to allow sins because these attacks are going to be like a death blow. If they begin to come in they come and enter into your back and from your back they try to penetrate into your lungs and to shut down your breathing mechanism. So it's the sins that people do that bring down the shield of their protection. That shield is a shield that protects your faith. When you have too much doubt, too many waswases means you're sinning. It's like any doctor you come and say, okay I have all these blisters, the doctor knows immediately you must be eating a lot of sugar because these marks that are coming are known to them. They know that what you do its effect is going to be on your physicality. So they merely just scan your physicality, they know what you're doing incorrect in your physiology. Imagine then for akhirah, it's so much easier. When somebody has excessive doubts, excessive concerns, too many waswases, is you have too many sins. You're wasting your time on heedless and needless things that you're doing and you know best what you're doing. You're doing something that not pleasing by Allah you think it to be something minor but it only takes a leak for a shaitan to come through. So like you have a crack in your house, you don't need to have the door open for the, the lion to come through, you just need a crack for the rats to come through. And they come through very small crack because they can squeeze their body in. Communicating with people who are not married is a sin, doing things that are not correct in Allah's eyes is a sin. That sin is all the shaitan needs to enter in. When he enters in this is not anymore like before. These devils are all around trying to destroy and to kill. We pray that Allah inspire us to understand and to build our energies and protect ourselves. These salawats, these duruj, when you read the words you understand this, the, this guy's not making up, these awliyaullah wrote all of these that protect me, protect me, protect me. I've been overcome by these desires, I have been overcome by shaitan. You think it's a coincidence that at the time that people are dying when they can't take a breath, their tree of life is being extinguished and burned like we saw in Lord of the Rings when the shaitan set the fire to the tree. Allah gave his marketing, Allah had his marketing go out all over the world in, in these movies, they're inspired. And the tree of life is burning and shaitan that's what he's happy for. In this case he's saying that sinning or compromising one's integrity lowers our energetic protection and allows for this possession to occur. Of course this concept of being possessed or taken over by some external entity or energy can be taken in different ways. For example some Christian denominations encourage being taken over by the Holy Ghost or Divine Spirit of God and while they shake uncontrollably it is perceived positively. This phenomena can be found across multiple cultures including Sufism and here we observe a similar type of shaking that occurs when the member is touched and a divine energy is allegedly passed through the religious leader into the subject.
Some scholars of the Middle East hold that they originate as malevolent spirits residing in deserts and unclean places. Majlis al-Jinn, which is Arabic for meeting place or gathering place of the jinn, is located in a remote area of the Selma Plateau in Oman. It is recognized as one of the largest underground caves in the world, and there are three different entrances to the cave, all of which link to an enormous chamber. The deepest part is 178 meters, which is 584 feet below the top, and to put that into perspective, 12 Boeing 747 jumbo planes would fit inside that cave chamber, and there's a local legend that tells of a beautiful woman named Selma who inhabited the cave long ago, and an enormous jinn, which comes down to us as genie in the West, pursued Selma and was very upset with her. There are numerous stories like this, often attributed to mystical or sacred places, which had been worshipped by many Arabs during the pre-Islamic period, said to be inhabited by pagan nature deities, who gradually became marginalized as other deities took greater importance. It seems that the veneration of jinn or similar unseen forces had played more importance in the everyday life of pre-Islamic Arabs than the gods themselves. According to common Arabian belief, soothsayers, pre-Islamic philosophers, and poets were inspired by jinn, and this can be compared to the ancient Greek notion of demons, which did not necessarily carry the negative connotations that we have today. In the writings of Plato, Socrates discusses a voice that, quote, always forbids me to do something which I am going to do, but never commands me to do anything. In the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, who was a Roman co-emperor from the year 161 AD until 180 AD, and whose work still survives today, he makes reference to a demon being inside of himself, and such demons being inside of every human. Quote, live with the gods, and he does live with the gods who constantly shows to them his own soul is satisfied with that which is assigned to him, and that it does all that the demon wishes, which Zeus hath given to every man for his guardian and guide, a portion of himself. And this is every man's understanding and reason. So in this context, it's certainly not an evil entity, but something divine, a faculty of divine rationality. That said, jinn were feared because they were thought to be responsible for various mental illnesses. They also thought jinn could possess people. With that in mind, let's take another look at some footage of Sufi ritual gatherings, where I'll leave it up to the viewer to decide if the members are having a mystical experience, a possession, or experiencing mental illness. The members take turns touching their leader and apparently being infused with some sort of energy. This sort of mysticism looks similar to the faith healings in some Christian denominations with similar ancient religious practices in Africa and Asia, which Orthodox Muslims tend to condemn as heathen. Their aim is to seek what they call ultimate truth, and they meet with their spiritual guides or leaders who facilitate these rituals as the way to truth is not academic, but is experienced through spiritual possession. The guide allegedly generates chi, prana, or vril inside of his body through techniques that vary across various cultures, and then allegedly passes this on to whoever he touches. If this is a placebo effect or not, I'll leave it to you to decide because there's no way to know for sure without your own direct experience. But I will say that in places like India, 
this touch from the guru is perceived as a potential awakening, an activation of sorts, known as Shakti, the primordial cosmic energy that represents the dynamic, blissful life forces that are thought to move through the entire universe. It hit me. It was as though a sonic boom had occurred just above my head. And I don't know exactly how to describe it, except that a level of my being was opened that I never knew existed. It was absolutely incredible. Tremendous love, tremendous ecstasy. And this went on for about two weeks. I mean, I was a complete basket case. It was all I could do to put one foot in front of the other. You know, I mean, I'm, I tried to be a very controlled person. I very much just like freaking out in front of other people. So I, it was about two weeks before I could chant without weeping. You know, I mean, it was, it was a terribly, terribly profound experience, and I found that it never leaves. Baba himself left home at 15 to search for the direct experience of God. He became a monk and received his religious name, Muktananda, which means bliss of freedom. He met and lived with many of India's holy men and gurus and claims to have mastered many forms of yoga. But in spite of all this, he said that his search only bore fruit when, after 25 years of wandering, he met his own guru, Bhagavan Nityananda, who transmitted the force that awakened him. The force is called Shakti. So the guru's role is twofold. First, to awaken the disciples' spiritual energy, and then to guide them through what may be a long process of maturing until they share the Guru's spiritual awareness. This whole process is called Siddha Yoga. Siddha Yoga is an internal process rather than an external technique. Many people are familiar with the different forms of Kundalini Yoga that are practiced under an external teacher. He may have you concentrate on different chakras of the body, different energy centers, uh, he may give you different breathing exercises to perform, may have you do different hatha yoga postures and so on. But in Siddha Yoga, this all happens spontaneously as the result of the touch of the guru or as a result of receiving the guru's grace, Shaktipat. Uh, you often hear many people immediately begin automatically to do this pranayama. Some people do automatic hatha yoga postures. When it's called for, it occurs. You see, it's the guru actually transmits his own consciousness into you, you see, and it can, it's, it's fully intelligent and continues to function inside you. We have come to the focus of the Swami's visit, two days of intensive spiritual exercises. Everyone has been urged to keep their attention directed within, to meditate on their own inner being, and not to be distracted by what may happen around them, because now is the time at which the most concentrated effect of the Guru's presence may be felt. The awakening of Kundalini by the Guru's touch. So remember, <coughs> one thing Baba will do is to breathe into your nostrils. That's the way he has it giving Shakti time. That's the that energy of his breath, his life force is that he's breathing into you. So all you have to remember at that time is to breathe in, to take it all in.
After the ceremony, there's a session when the participants share with each other what they experienced in the meditation. The atmosphere is so highly charged that the outsider can't help wondering if this isn't just the triggering off of pent-up emotions which sometimes trip over into hysteria, and if enlightenment isn't just a form of neurosis. And if it is something else, how is it different from these psychological disorders? We put this question to an educational psychologist from the University of Michigan, who's been associated with Muktananda and watched this effect many times. What is it that makes it different and makes it other, what makes it not, not a hysteria, not a... You begin to see that people's lives change in a positive way. And, you be, and that, that's a little vague, but what I mean by that, and it's vague because I'm talking about a whole group of people at once, but what I mean by that is that <clears throat> And the hysteria just goes on and on and on and on, and the person literally starts, uh, their lives start to disintegrate, start, start to crumble. Whereas with this, it doesn't go on and on and on, there's more crumbling and more crumble. What happens is, it happens, it's over with, the person understands something to that, and they rise to a new, a higher level. Um, they, become, they get clearer on life. Uh, they feel more connected to their world, not more alienated. You know, when you're talking about psychology and different manifestations, disorders, Essentially, you're talking about being alienated from the world. And what I see all the time are people getting more and more in touch with their world, being able to move in situations that they never were able to move in before, being able to relate to people that they could never relate to before, uh, being able to just be and live life the way that they could never do it before. So all of those things are things that, from a psychologist's point of view, makes, you have to say, this is different. Rumi was a Persian poet, an Islamic dervish, and a Sufi mystic. His poetry and wisdom have crossed all national and ethnic borders ever since the 13th century. In the words of Rumi, here are some of his most famous quotes. Stop acting so small. You are the universe in ecstatic motion. What you seek is seeking you. Don't grieve. Anything you lose comes around in another form. Don't be satisfied with stories, how things have gone with others. Unfold your own myth. Raise your words, not voice. It is rain that grows flowers, not thunder. Set your life on fire. Seek those who fan your flames. I know you're tired, but come. This is the way. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.